Good morning and welcome to the Morning Scoop for Wednesday, May 19th. This is your Daily Buckeye Fix. I'm Tom Moore. The Minnesota game is in 106 days. The game against Michigan in 192 days. Our season preview series continues today with the Northwestern Wildcats. My guest today is Daniel Olinger. He is the editor-in-chief of Inside NU. Daniel, thanks for joining me. Uh, thanks for having me on, Tom. Glad to be here. So the Wildcats won the West. They, they just, they're like one of the more up and down teams in the country, it seems, just depending on like, do they have everyone back? Do they have no one back? Last year, they were up. They won the West, played Ohio State tough in the Big Ten championship game. And then now in a year when most teams in the country are getting back like a huge percentage of their top performers because of the NCAA uh, giving players that extra year of eligibility, Northwestern is losing more than just about anybody in the country. Uh, by one metric that I looked at, only BYU lost more. So for a team that doesn't stack up four and five star recruits very often, that seems like it pretty much has to mean a step back, at least to some degree this fall. Is that is that accurate in your mind? Yeah. So I don't know if they're necessarily up and down. I mean, the thing is, it was weird because obviously they had sandwiched between two Big Ten title game appearances against Ohio State, that horrible three and nine season. Um, that was kind of an anomaly in the sense that you couldn't play have worse quarterback play than they had that entire season where the offense just wasn't functional in any sense of the word. I think it was like the only teams they had more passing yards all season that year were the three uh, triple option teams. So it was very much like just that was like <laughs> it, it, that was, I think, the outlier year is just it wasn't going to happen that year. And they're obviously like I would say there's probably going to be some step back that they were so experienced in 2020 that defense was just filled with seniors, guys who had been there, had been to the Big Ten championship before and came back again and were ready to win. Um, so, yeah, I would say, like, there's definitely a step back potentially coming with how, much, how many new guys they're going to have. And, you know, all, they have to replace their transfer quarterback, Peyton Ramsey, who was very good for them this past year. So, yeah, like maybe a step back to the Northwestern you've probably come to know over the 2010s, which is about seven and five, eight and four, nine and three, if, it, if it's a good year, but like, well, so like maybe having only one loss heading into the big 10 championship that may, might not be at that level, but this isn't going to be like they regress all the way back to 2019 where they were down near the worst teams in the big 10. But you mentioned losing Peyton Ramsey there, and they had a total they have a, a total of six quarterbacks in right now, uh, including Ryan Holinsky, who is a transfer from South Carolina. Do you have any sense? I mean, that is a lot of quarterbacks. Like if Ohio State is a three quarterback race, and that's like, oh, that's a lot to keep in mind. And Northwestern's got twice that. So do you have any sense for which guy or guys are kind of coming out of the spring sort of at the top of the depth chart right now? Well, yeah, it's like most things where... <laughs> There are six quarterbacks, but it's not a six quarterback race. There's very much, it's pretty clear, I think, that who could be competing for the job. Uh, I think I wrote down numbers here, like just if I had to take a guess, like it, it feels like it would be Ryan Holinsky because if they're bringing in a transfer and a guy who did have experience at South Carolina, you're bringing that guy in because, like Peyton Ramsey, you're thinking he can step in and produce for your team. Now, I wouldn't say it's impossible for Hunter Johnson, who's now this is going to be his third year there, where third year where he's eligible to play the five former five star at Clemson. I mean, it's never come together for him, but it's definitely possible that he could still win the job. I don't think they're saying like it's imp that Hunter is just out and he's going to be a backup here. If, if he does beat out Helensky, that is possible. And then like Andrew Marty, who they've used as most famously used as an option quarterback, when in that three nine season they upset Illinois basically just running option all game with him he's gotten a few snaps before like he I would doubt he would win the job but I wouldn't say it's just utterly impossible for him and then the other three like I'll, they're just not winning the job so it's probably going I would say like 55 percent it's Ryan Helensky 40 percent it's Hunter Johnson five percent it's Andrew Marty and of course I'm just like speculating there there's no like inside like oh this is what they're thinking right now but if I just had to guess that's what I would put it at if that, if that all makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. And and I mean, they're kind of starting from scratch at wide receiver as well. They lost, I think, their top four wide receivers from last year. What, was there anyone that kind of jumped out there this spring, or is that going to kind of be a little bit of a rebuilding project? Yeah. So this is a funny stat I pulled that uh, Northwestern's returning um, leading receiver was Cam Porter, who was their running back, who only started the last three games <laughs> and had nine receptions. So yeah, it's a lot of receiving production is going to be missing. They do get J.J. Jefferson back, who missed most of the season, with, missed, missed pretty much all of the season with injury. He wasn't a huge receiver for them, although 
you had to take all 2019 receiving stats from Northwestern with a grain of salt because they had no one to really throw them the ball. And that, that kind of made things difficult. Uh, Berkeley Holman's gotten some playing time. Malik Washington's gotten some looks. So it, it is basically a completely new receiver room in some ways. So, I mean, <laughs> they're, they're basically, I would guess if Northwestern, they obviously know their guys better than all of us, but they're probably looking around saying, okay, which one of you guys is going to step up? Because it is like, it is open tryouts here. Who is Who are going to be receivers now? Because we relied a lot on Ramad Chokio Bowman this last year, though. Big physical receiver get open, didn't drop a lot, didn't really drop passes. He's just really solid all around. Riley Lee's I was able, making underneath catches forever. Like stuff like that is just gone now. So it's a completely new room for them to work with a little, some young guys and, and some guys who've been around a little bit. Last year, Northwestern had a new offensive coordinator. That was something that worked out pretty well because I think the uh, the previous regime had kind of gone a little bit stale. This year, they have a new defensive coordinator, Mike Hankwitz, who had been the D.C. since 2008, just retired. He was someone who I don't think anyone was in a rush to push him out the door. Their defense has generally been very good, been the side of the ball they can really rely on for the most part. Are you expecting to see any significant changes on that side of the ball under uh, Jim O'Neill, who's the new D.C.? Or, you know, maybe is this not that big of a change because this is sort of like, you know, behind the scenes, Pat Fitzgerald is really, I mean, he's obviously a former linebacker, knows defense very well. Is that just kind of Pat Fitzgerald's side of the ball anyway, and it doesn't really make a big difference who the D.C. is? I mean, I, I think it definitely makes a big difference because Mike Hankwitz, like, it was very much his defense. Uh, the players all talked about how much they loved him, how well he understood the game, how a committee was to watching film, always having plans for them, how, how well he schemed up things. I, he's the one, like, very much, I'm sure, like, him and Fitzgerald work together, obviously. They both understand defense very well, but, like, putting together their game plan against Ohio State in the Big Ten Championship that gave them a chance in that game where basically deciding that they're going to do they will die before they let Justin Fields get going the passing game just drop everyone back is like they which is kind of what they had to do just admit that this we're going to take this away from them um so I would say that there's I don't know if it's like there could be there's obviously obviously going to be changes because it's someone else coaching them but I would say that Ideally, Northwestern doesn't want to change things. So maybe they'll like, I, I don't know if Jim O'Neill would try and do some of the same stuff Mike Hankwitz does. I mean, every coach is going to have some of their same, like their own philosophies that are personal to them. But I would say like they're probably going to try and do a lot of similar stuff just because it's worked really well for them in the past 20 years. They've been a good defensive team that's become a winning program because they usually are really good on defense. So I would say they, They'll probably stick to like their most identifiable like traits, their characteristics, maybe change up a few of like smaller details. But yeah, yeah, it was like there'll be small changes, but I don't think it's anything grandstanding. So personnel wise on that side of the ball, like what what is the biggest strength? What's the biggest concern on the defense for, um, you know, is there, is there one unit that that's looking pretty good coming out of spring or that that it's like kind of the big question mark? Like what where are they looking good? Where are they looking bad right now on defense? Yeah, so I would say that their biggest strength is definitely still their secondary like it was last year because, I mean, you watch their secondary last year. They have they had Greg Newsom, who just got drafted by the Cleveland Browns, was a shutdown corner, awesome player, and they have another guy who, if he has a really good season, could be a first-round pick again, and Brandon Joseph at safety. So, to, like, just you have the talent right there is really good, and they're bringing back, like, obviously losing Newsom and losing J.R. Pace as they did. Their safety was a senior, really good for them. Those are going to hurt, but they still have a lot of talent there. Like as long as Brandon Joseph is back there, he had one of the best seasons I I've seen from a safety ever. He's just unbelievable all year. Not just racking up interceptions, but he's just he he like it is hard to say like he makes plays. The very first game of the season against Maryland, like they tried to run a some kind of like pitch to a running back, and he sprinted from the safety position and got a tackle in the backfield. He just he can really fly around out there and is kind of a special player. And then you have guys like AJ Hampton coming back who he's been really solid, had a good year last year. Rod Hurd, Cam Mitchell, Coco Azima, these guys have all got reps. Uh, They'll probably adjust around trying to probably adjusting to find that safety next to Brandon Joseph, maybe converting one of those guys because I mean, they're all very experienced, but I would say secondary, they feel probably pretty confident in what they have considering how good they were last year and bring back enough of those guys. Um, 
defensively, I mean, linebacker and defensive line, they definitely, I would say linebacker, they lost two very important pieces in Blake Gallagher and Patty Fisher. Returning Chris Bergen, who gets to play again, he's the undersized linebacker, but has made plenty of great plays and been solid throughout his whole career. Uh, although I think they like their linebacker depth, so they're probably confident. And they've gotten like they've had time to get some of those guys like Peter McIntyre like in to like into games, get them some reps, get them some experience. So I, I think they're they're going to be able to look at a lot of new things at linebacker. They're not the guys that they've consistently had over the last few years, but they they're probably still fine at linebacker generally. Defensive line was their weakest position this past year. Which I mean, it's hard when you have one of the best defenses in the country saying that's your weakest position group. You know, it sounds like enough, but it's like they were ultimately fine. Um, I I think they're like they returned Adetami Adabare, who was I mean I'm a big fan of him. He's very fast for a defensive lineman. Usually makes a few plays every game where he just beats someone off the off the line of scrimmage and get in the backfield. Uh, and they brought in a transfer from West Virginia, Jeffrey Pooler Jr., who. He's not not like a breakout star or anything, but he's had solid production at West Virginia, a Big 12 school, and he can probably come in and play for them at defensive end and be fine. Um, Sam Dutt Miller has seen time, too, and he's had some good good play. Uh, you have guys like Trevor Kent, Joe Spivak, just some guys who've like you've seen their names around. They've never made tons of plays, but you'll see them make a few tackles every every once in a while in the season. But defensive line is just like, they don't, besides potentially at a bar, right, if he goes up another level his passing, because he went from like just rotational piece to very good, one of their best defensive linemen this past year. Maybe he takes next step up to like a real difference maker, all Big Ten level player. He's probably the one guy who could do that. But other than that defensive line, it's like they, they're fine. They don't have any weakness probably there, but it's like no, no, no standout players, whereas they might feel like they have it at other positions on the defense. I want to switch gears to recruiting real quick, real quick, because I was looking through their past classes and their current classes, and something really jumped out to me. They had two players ranked as four stars in the classes of 2018, 19, and 20 combined. And then they brought in three guys who are four stars in 2021. There's another one committed already for 2022. Is that like that fantastic new facility right on the lakefront? Is that is that what's bringing people in? Is it the on-field success? Is it something else? Is it just like a mystery? And, you know, is it something that they can continue? Is that something that might they might be able to kind of carry forward now and just bring that level of talent in the program just up just a little bit more? I mean, that's the that's what they're selling to the media when they tell us uh, that the facilities have really helped over the past years. I mean, it's I walk by it all the time. It's a very nice building. It's right, like you said, right on the lake. It's all very high tech, all great stuff like that. And you know kept hammering home during this past NFL draft season, how important it is that this is the first time ever Northwestern had multiple first round picks and along Penn state, I believe were the only teams to have two first round picks in the big 10 this year. I think that's right. Um, I'm trying to make sure I think away from Penn state got taken in the first round, if I'm remembering co- correctly, but um, yeah. So like basically selling that they shows they can produce talent. Like I said, they Brandon Joseph maybe is another year away, another good year away from being a first round pick. Their left tackle, Peter Skaronsky, was dominant as a true freshman and could very likely be a first round pick in, after two, two more seasons at Northwestern. So, kind of like it's a, like a combination of all these things. This is what, like, obviously, like, don't know everything that, like, why, you can't get into the minds of recruits and think why they're more convinced to come. But the, the way the program pitches is that, yeah, they've kind of ascent, they've ascended up over the past few years. They've got this new facility. They've They've shown that they can win their division, and it's not just a fluke. They've now done it twice in three years, that they can produce NFL talent, all that kinds of stuff. So I think it's just like, you know, it's like most things. It's all coalescing together that they've kind of, Northwestern is like just here to stay as a legit Big Ten program. You hear Pat Fitzgerald's name come up from time to time for other jobs, um, you know, but he's at this point, like he played at Northwestern. He's been a coach at Northwestern and assistant since 2001 head coach there since 2006. It seems like he's got that program pretty close to the kind of realistic high watermark for the program. I mean, Northwestern is never going to be Alabama for any number of reasons, but you know, I mean, if you're in the big 10 championship game, two out of every three, you know, two out of three years, like that's pretty darn respectable. Do you see any reason to think he might jump at another job at this, you know, at some point, or do you think he's, you know, based on your, what you've heard from him talking to him, like, is he going to be a lifer there? I mean, that's the thing, like, 
me, me or you or any other person could probably see a reason to jump at another job. I don't think Pat Fitzgerald does. Cause I think he loves Northwestern. He loves this place. He's basically spent his whole life here almost at this point and just signed that giant contract. Uh, you know, the rumors coming up because his name's a fun one to throw around. I think he, people know who he is. They know what he's done. And he, he obviously like he has very, a lot of supporters out there, but he seems like nothing he's ever done is shown but shown like that he's committed to this place and that he believes in building this place up so i I, i'm pretty confident he's going to stay around for a while at least through the remainder of that next this new contract he signed (laughs) so i was looking through the schedule and something jumped out to me i didn't realize they have a game against purdue scheduled to wrigley field this fall now they they tried that once before against uh, illinois back in 2010 and they had to only use one end zone because there wasn't enough room to actually fit the field on you know with enough space that kids weren't going to go face first into the brick wall or something behind one of the end zones. So have they gotten that figured out so they can play at both ends of the field at Wrigley this year? See, I mean, I, I, am not like a Wrigley field operator, so I have no clue, but (laughs) I would, I would hope so if they're going to try it again. Um, and, uh, I, I remember watching that game as a kid, like just to be here about and thinking how funny that was. Uh, So you would have to think that they, probably did fix it because why are you scheduling it again if you didn't fix it but you know i mean weirder things have happened so yeah <laughs> so, i know they've done a lot of renovation there since that 2010 so i didn't know if they moved a wall back or something or if they you know if they have movable stands or something but yeah that we'll have to that that'll be an interesting one to keep an eye on because it, it's one of those those games in baseball stadiums are always really interesting to see but like you know visually they're cool but yeah, that's a uh, that that'll be. Uh, oh, I, I would have to assume they would have fixed something at that point, but it yeah, feels, they will get mocked relentlessly if they didn't fix it and they have to do it again. Yeah. <laughs> so, all right, let's look at the rest of the schedule. It is like loaded with really interesting games. They've got Duke and Ohio University out of conference at Duke, home for Ohio University. Those are both games that could go either way, especially if they're sort of getting some stuff sorted out at the beginning of the year. They miss both Ohio State and Penn State cross division, which is a nice break. So. What would constitute a successful season for the Cats this year? I mean, we talked about the fact that they may take a little bit of a step back, but you know, what what would be short of you know getting back to the Big Ten championship game? What would what would be kind of a successful season to Northwestern fans this year? Yeah, and obviously, like successful season to Northwestern fans and the Northwestern program within the program are very different things. Um, <laughs> and Pat, as Pat Fitzgerald says, the next step is they've made the step where they've shown they're here, and he wants to win the Big Ten title now, not just get there. Um, and like I said, like. You pointed to like Duke and Ohio as games that go either way. I, I would say them and probably actually most Northwestern fans feel like they're at the point where they should just beat those teams. Now, Duke has given, they've had some very interesting games with Duke. So mm-hmm. that, that'll be like a kind of a fun one to see. But um, yeah, I, I do think it's also interesting. Like they had that stretch near the second half of the season, Michigan, Minnesota, Iowa, Wisconsin, which is pretty rough. Um, but you hope they can take them. I mean, those are probably... If I had to guess, those will all be four very close games, probably in the tens and twenties, like most Northwestern games are, which could all go either way. Um, so yeah, I would say for Northwestern fans, a successful season is just not dropping, obviously not dropping back down like they did in 2019 to three and nine and barely watchable. That that would obviously be a disaster, like that season was. And I'm pretty sure that won't happen. But instead of like dropping to six and six, seven and five, like at least going like eight and four showing that this is still a very good team. This is still a, an above average power five team and above average big 10 team showing that they are like still very much one of the better teams of the conference, even if they're not going to the big 10 championship, something like that would be probably constitute a successful season. All right. Now let people know where they can find you on Twitter and where they can read your work. Yeah. So you can find me on Twitter at Dan underscore Olinger, D a N underscore O L I N G E R. And yeah, you can read my work at Inside and You, where I'm the editor in chief, where we cover all things Northwestern sports. And you can also read, I cover the Philadelphia 76ers for Liberty Ballers, which is uh, writing about the Sixers and talking about them for a podcast that I host every Friday. So yeah, you can find all my work there. And yeah, thanks for having me on, Tom. All right, Daniel, thank you again for joining me. Really appreciate it. Make sure you check out his work at InsideNU.com. And also make sure you check out BuckeyeScoop.com. We have a a fantastic team of insiders covering the Buckeyes from just about every angle you can imagine. Uh, Mark Givler just got back from his uh, recruiting trip down south. Just had him on yesterday's show. We have uh, Nevada Buck churning out great inside nuggets from inside the the program. Kirk Barton giving the former players perspective. Ross Fulton on the the X's nose. 
got Bill Green, Mick Walker, Dominic Smith, all covering recruiting. We've got we've got everything covered from every possible angle. Tony Gerdeming, our beat writer. We got we got a little bit of everything for you. So you can find that all at BuckeyeScoop.com. Also, make sure you check out all of our great podcasts. They are on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, SoundCloud, Springer, Spotify. You name it, we're there. Just search Buckeye Scoop. You'll find them all. You can subscribe right there and also leave us a five-star rating and review, which will help other folks find those shows as well. And finally, youtube.com slash Buckeye Scoop. We put all our podcasts up there. We also have uh, interviews with players, camp videos, interviews with coaches. It's all there. YouTube.com slash Buckeye Scoop. Just hit that subscribe button and you can get notified every time we post a new video. That, of course, is all free. That'll do it for today. Thank you guys all for joining us. Have a great day. We will talk to you tomorrow.